Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you all. My name is Pastor Daniel, in case you didn't know that. Uh, can't find my name tag. No idea. No idea. Going to have to maybe order another one or uh, do a deep dive into the recesses of my junk drawer. Uh, but uh, it's good to be back. It's good to see you all. Today we have a very special uh, program, and uh, I want to give you just a little bit of backstory of this. Uh, you may remember that we, CTK, were awarded a sabbatical grant that covered a, a whole host of things, including my travel and um, for uh, David Kildy to, to take over in my stead. And one of the things that we wrote into that grant, which was over a year ago now, was that Reverend Dr. Catherine Shaner would come here to CTK and while uh, we were taking a trip to Greece uh, in Turkey, she would talk about some of her work in the New Testament and some of her work um, in uh, excavation sites too also, uh, which we saw a lot of. So we wanted that parallel. And then when we got the grant, um, I got to make the phone call to Catherine and say, hey, you don't know this, but I wrote a grant with your name in it and uh, now we can, uh, we can bring you in for two times. So. She was here once already, uh, actually the really coincided with that trip that we took to Greece. And today uh, she's gonna give us the part two. Um, I met uh, Dr. Shaner, how long have you been in North Carolina now? Eight years, yeah. Yeah, so ten, almost 10 years. Uh, this summer <coughs> she came to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is where I was a pastor. And uh, I thought it was super cool that at Wake Forest Baptist Divinity School, the New Testament scholar is a Lutheran pastor. How great is that? How great is that? Uh, and then right after that, uh, Pastor Athena came to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and the three of us got to pal around for a while. And um, so when I had mentioned this to Pastor Athena, she was like, oh, I can't wait to help coordinate this thing with Dr. Shaner. So, Really grateful that you're here. Thanks for accepting our invitation. And um, she's going to lecture for, call it 35 minutes or so. <clears throat> and then I might do uh, five or so minutes at the end. But um, please help me welcome the Reverend Dr. <laughs> Catherine Shaner. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, thank you. No, it's great to have the band back together again. <laughs> um, and it is always a privilege to be here. Um, did you all go to Ephesus? Okay. How many of you all went with Pastor Daniel to Greece? Anybody here? Woo! All right. We're starting new. I love it. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit today about is diversity and difference in, in early Christian Christ-following communities. And if you were here last time I was here, great. We're going to do some continuation of that. If you weren't here, no big deal. This will all be, it's all self-contained. But one of the things I really want to talk about, so my research deals with enslaved people, slaves and slavery in the ancient world. Um, and one of the things when I started my research, this was more than 10 years ago that I started this research, um, I started to ask, as I was on trips, much like the others from CTK were, I started to ask, where are the slaves in the archaeology? And I was asking the archaeologists, I was asking the scholars, I was asking the tour guides, and everybody was saying, oh, psh, we know they were there somewhere, but there's nothing to show from slaves. And so that kind of became a challenge for me. And I was like, you know what? I am going to find the slaves in these cities. What happens when you start to look for the enslaved people in cities is you start to see how diverse, and I said I was going to be up here. Actually, I'm, there we go. Now I can see all your faces. <laughs> um, you start to see exactly how diverse a city is and how diverse the experience is and how little you actually see when you just sort of walk through a site. So I want to take us first on a reminder that what we're talking about when we talk about these spaces, these spaces and places, is really the ecclesia in Christ. Anywhere in the ancient city is where Christians were. We don't have, before the fourth century, so before 300 CE, we have absolutely no evidence. Okay, maybe not absolutely no. We have very little evidence of specific places where Christians gathered. Why? 
because they didn't have the kind of communities that can create a whole huge space like this. Um, they had tiny little communities who were meeting in churches, they were meeting by, by the river, outdoors, they were meeting wherever they could meet. And I want us to look at some of those specific places in Ephesus. So as a reminder of where we're going, um, we are going to this part of the world. This here is Athens, this is Greece. Um, here's Jerusalem and Egypt for your reference. Um, we're going to go right here. We're going to go to a place called Ephesus. Now here's the thing. Our early Christian texts, so Paul's letters, don't. there is a letter to the Ephesians in our New Testament. <laughs> Forget this. There is a letter that says it's to the Ephesians in our New Testament. Most of what's in Ephesians is contained in Colossians also. And so what we think is that this was a letter that um, was copied and recopied and recopied, and there's no sort of specific greeting. So all that is to say, we have nothing from Ephesus in particular, but Ephesus is this amazing um, cosmopolitan kind of place in the ancient world. So Ephesus is right here in the ancient, in the ancient world. Is that right? Yep. Nope. Sorry, right here. Um, and Ephesus, as you can see, it's right on the coast. Now, today it's not on the coast anymore. Um, but in the ancient world, this was one of the most important, busiest, um, most um, wealthiest harbors, port cities in the ancient world. Um, and so we hear that Paul has been in Ephesus many times. That's not surprising to us because it is, again, this center of commerce, but it's also the place where you go get a boat to Corinth. It's also the place where you go get the boat to Athos or you know, head up the coast, on up the coast to Philippi, which we saw last time as well. Um, so Ephesus becomes this sort of center for many kinds of early Christian ministries, not just Paul's ministries, many kinds of different ministries. But in particular, let's look at Paul. So Acts 19 says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Apollos was another preacher in this world of early Christians, um, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus where he found some disciples. So Acts tells us that Paul travels overland to get to Ephesus. And when he gets to Ephesus, it's not that he finds people who know Paul. It's that he finds people who know Jesus, right? And so... Paul finds disciples, but they may not be the same kind of disciples that Paul was used to working with. He simply finds a community that is also gathered around Jesus. Um, and 1 Corinthians 15 says, If merely human hopes I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it? Um, we don't actually know whether Paul was put into the arena to fight wild animals or if this is... Um, um, or if it was a possibility at one point. But I think because the Roman presence in Ephesus was so enormous, I think Paul probably did find himself in trouble in Ephesus. But here's the thing that everybody also knows. Ephesus is the hotbed for Roman Empire in this part of the world. And so anytime you're in trouble with the Roman Empire, probably things are going to ha be happening in and around Ephesus with that. There certainly were gladiator fights in Ephesus. There certainly were wild animal fights. We have the bones to prove it. And one summer, I, Ephesus is one of the sites that I actually worked at. Um, and I worked for about 10 weeks one summer with the excavators there. From, they're mostly from Austria, but also from Turkey. Um, and there were these two guys who sat in the back room in sort of like these, you know, rows and rows of boxes. It was very dusty, and they looked at bones all day long. That's all they did. But they could get a little bitty fish bone and tell you what species of fish that came from and whether it was an eating fish or um, another kind of fish, right? So one of the things that I thought was really cool was that they showed me some bones from animals who were killed in gladiatorial fights. They showed me bones from uh, humans who were either had been killed in gladiatorial fights or who had been injured their injuries had healed, and then they'd been buried in a gladiator cemetery, right? So what, what, what you get to see from these little scraps of bones are the varied ways in which different kinds of sort of folklore we get from the Roman Empire actually plays out in people's lives. 
what would it be like to think about a gladiator who'd broken his arm in a gladiatorial fight, maybe even someone like Paul, not Paul, but maybe someone like Paul who'd broken his arm, who had had it set, who'd had it um, knit, and then was put back into the arena again, right? What kind of life is that? It, it sort of captures the imagination. Um, and I think Paul's um, mention of this piece of culture helps us to have some of that imagination. All right, let's go to the city, since you all haven't seen it, and I get like super excited whenever I get to talk about Ephesus. Um, this is the map of the city. So there was an ancient harbor, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, um, where there were ships coming from all over the west so, and from the south. So they'd come up from Alexandria, they'd come from Jerusalem, they'd come from Cyprus, they'd come from Rome, from Athens. Um, this is a, one of the busiest hubs, again, in the ancient world. Um, and the city is essentially built around two hill, two, um, two large mountains. They're not really mountains if you come from Colorado, but they're mountains in Turkey. Um, <laughs> one is the Boboda, and one is the Panayirda. And on here, these are the English names, Mount Karasos and Mount Pion. The city is built essentially in a circle around the um, smaller of these two mountains. But this road is a deep valley. So you have slopes on many sides of the city. And what you have to imagine is that this city was built up on the slopes so that if you come into the harbor, you see inhabitants. You see building all over the slopes. Much like if you um, drive into New York City and all of a sudden all of those buildings come up and pop up and you see the skyline in front of you, it looks like that only on the side of a hill. So we're going we're gonna to stand right here and look out over the harbor. I'm standing um, in the theater, actually, up a little bit higher. And what we're looking at here is the main road that goes down to what was the ancient harbor. Now, you'll notice there is no water there right now. And you're going to have to go about 10 kilometers to the uh, west before you find any water. Why is this? Because the ancient harbor silted in with the river that runs along the valley over on this, on this side. Right? This is um, ecological change was different in the ancient world, but it was very real. So this harbor was constantly being silted in, and the Romans would have to dredge it out so that it could still function as a harbor. But once the Roman city, in about the 6th century, so about 700 CE, the Roman city ceased to be, um, as we know it, another city arose up. But at that point, they let the harbor silt in because Ephesus became more important for overland trade than for sea trade at that moment in time. So you have to think about this as a harbor city, and you have to kind of imagine a bunch of ships out in that, out in that port. And what you can imagine are silks and cottons and grain and wine and um, spices and jewels and building materials, bricks, slaves. They're all coming through this port. Um, and they're all being shipped out from this port as well. So that makes this entire area of the city a busy, bustling space. A space where Christians, where enslaved people, where wealthy people and not wealthy people would all interact and intermix, right? And sometimes when you go to Ephesus, one of the, one of the things you'll hear um, from the tour guides, and this is just not right, because um, <laughs> funny story, one day I was working um, on the site, and I'll show you that spot in a moment, but I was working on the site, and these tourists came, and I heard the tour guides talking to them, and I, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, they're not getting the right information, they're not getting the right information, but then the tourists saw us and yelled down to us, hey there, and I was the only one who really spoke English well, and so I, I yelled back to them, and they were like, oh my gosh, it's an American, it turns out they were from Boston, and I was coming from Boston, anyway, um, one of the things that the tour guides are really uh, often will say is that there were no women in these spaces like this. There were no women at the harbor. There were no women in the agora. That might be true about respectable women, right? About women who were married to wealthy men who had titles, right? 
But it certainly wasn't true about all women. We know that there were lower um, economic, lower socioeconomically um, uh, women who were part of selling things, who were part of shipping things, who were being shipped in and out, who were there for the entertainment of the sailors as they came through. So we, sometimes I think when we start to think about these spaces of antiquity, we also have to imagine that our stereotypes about what was going on in antiquity color the ways that we imagine people back into these spaces. And so we have to go back and undo some of those stereotypes. So there were women all over the place in these spaces. They just weren't the women you see in statues, right? The women who wore the jewels or the women who um, would be considered respectable types, right? Now, what, I'm, what we're going to do is we're going to walk down. Um, one of the things you can see, these are, these are some tourists in the area. You can see just how enormous all of this is, right? This is um, a 10-foot wide street, um, and it comes straight up to the theater, and we're going to go stand right here so that I can show you the theater. And here's those same people, right? So you can see exactly how enormous this is. This is one of the first things you would see if you came into the port of Ephesus. Now, why is this important? It's important because look how many ranks of seats there are in this, in this theater. One, two, three, and there's a fourth one up above that has been destroyed. There's even some talk that there might have been a fifth tier promenade. This is the largest theater in the ancient world. And this would have been here when Paul walked into Ephesus, or when anyone who, Timothy walked into Ephesus, or Onesimus, or any of the folks that we know from our biblical text walked into Ephesus. Um, and the enormity of it is simply overwhelming. I mean, can you imagine if you come from a small town where, you know, your houses are all one story and all of a sudden you see this? It would be terrifying, wouldn't it? But you can also imagine that within this theater, so another stereotype that the, that the the tour guides like to say is that it was only men who went to the theater and it was only the those who were free who were at the theater but imagine this this is 20,000 plus people who can fit into this space there were not 20,000 plus free men in the ancient world in, in in Ephesus even in the surrounding areas so we actually start, when you start to look at the seats and the graffiti on seats, right? Because sometimes people come and they etch the graffiti. I mean, you've seen this in ordinary stadiums today. People aren't that much different today than they were 2020, or sorry, um, 2,000 years ago. People etch graffiti into the, into the seats. Well, on some of the seats it says, you know, I'm Timotheos, the slave of blah, blah, blah. This is my seat. Right, he's claiming his seat. Um, so what we start to see is that the, the even the theater shows us a diversity of folks within um, within its ranks. Um, I just wanted you to see this is the stage area. So I'm on I'm sitting up at the top of the second rank, and this is the circular stage. These pillars here are holding up a floor um, that would have been the stage, much like what I'm standing on right now. Um, and underneath would have been prop rooms, or maybe rooms for the wild animals, cages for the wild animals, or places where um, folks would prepare the show, um, places where special effects would happen. We know that there was probably a trap door somewhere on the stage that could have pulled an actor down really fast, or even pulled, pushed somebody up onto the stage, surprisingly. They did all kinds of special effects in the ancient theater. And... Um, in order to run this place, though, think about the numbers of people you would need. You need a lot of enslaved folks. You need a lot of um, not enslaved folks. You need a lot of folks with some real technical skills, right? And we can also imagine that you might have some folks who've heard of this Jesus guy who are underneath this stage, maybe, you know, feeding some uh, wild turkey to the lion, that is about to go out on stage. We know there was a door here, and this arena was often a place where animals would show up um, in, in the theater. Um, and so maybe there's a conversation over that turkey carcass that heads to the, that goes to the lion, 
right, that becomes then a conversation about who this Jesus guy is and why it's important to gather together around this Jesus guy. So that's, that's part of how we start to see diversity in our early Christian communities. Now, um, da Pastor Daniel, did you go down on the, on the stage? Did you, did you try out the acoustics? So, and how were they? Awesome. Yeah, the acoustics there are incredible. So you can stand right here. I have pictures of me standing right there too. I just didn't want to embarrass myself too early on. Um, if you stand there and you have to speak in a full voice, but if you speak in a full voice, they can hear you in the third rank. If you project, you can be heard, I'm sure, in that fifth rank. So the, the acoustics here are just incredible, which means there's a kind of technology and an attention to detail in the building and in the design that's also part of this ancient world that you know we often sort of think of it as barbaric and they don't have the technology we have, but actually they are incredibly sophisticated in the way that they put together their communal, um, their communal patterns. So the theater is really important for thinking about slaves and, and I wanted to talk a little bit about stereotypes in the theater. In Acts we get the story of Rhoda. Um, when Peter and Paul, sorry, when Peter, when Paul and Silas <laughs> start get, um, find themselves in jail in Philippi, they sing, right, for a while, and in the middle of the night, all of the, an earthquake comes, and it destroys the jail, and Paul and Silas find themselves free, along with all the other prisoners, right? Well, eventually the jailer lets them go, and they take off, and they go where? They go to Mary's house. Peter that the right story? Yeah. Peter, sorry. <laughs> I just had a, a, a moment there. Peter knocks on the gate and of Mary's house and a slave named Rhoda. Now it says in our text it says maid, but the word there is doulos, which is, or zuli, um, which is actually means she was enslaved. A slave named Rhoda comes to answer. And we get this hilarious story that ensues because she can't believe that it's Peter because he's supposed to be in jail. Right? And Peter's like, ah! um, and and Rhoda gets excited and runs overjoyed to go tell the other people. And the other people are like, eh, I won't. Okay, well, this is um, a Roman stereotype about slaves. There's a Roman stereotype that gets played out, particularly in the theater, of slaves as jovial, as jokers, as overly sort of childlike and exuberant. And we see that in the depiction of Rhoda in Acts, that she becomes this sort of um, buffoonish kind of character. Now we can also look past that reading of Rhoda and we can start to see that Rhoda was the first one to recognize Peter. Rhoda is the first one to um, be the guard for the community. Rhoda is the one who shows joy at the reunion of the community. Um, so there are ways to, to sort of actively work against these stereotypes, but you can kind of see, so these are statues of masks that would have been in the theater, and these masks, these aren't the actual masks, these are just stone carvings of them, but there would have been like paper mache masks, right, that were part of the theater performance. Um, and you can see, you can see some of this, this is, the equivalent in our culture is blackface or minstrelsy. If, um, if we want to really talk about the ways in which these stereotypes worked around larger systems of injustice in the ancient world. Let me stop. Any questions about theater? About this space of theater? Let's talk a little bit about the marketplace then. So if we just turn around from the from the theater, we see what looks like a giant field with some trees in it. But you can see there's a line of columns here and there's a row of doors here. And if you're there, you can kind of see that there's a, there's a closing of the square. This is a perfect square and we call it the Tetragonos Agora. That's, you know, the fancy dancy thing for saying it's the central marketplace of Ephesus. This is not far from the harbor, and it is also um, a place where you have to imagine bustling activity in, in the ancient world. And you have to imagine that there are all kinds of stalls and um, 
spaces, people sitting on the ground with blankets around them. Um, this space, it looks like it's open and looks like it's wide open, but it was probably um, very uh, tightly populated with folks who were selling things, right? Whether you're selling your melons that you grew and it's that time of year, or if you're selling the spices that your um, donkey just carried from China overland, or if you're selling the group of slaves you just got from the war in the East, right? Um, we have to imagine that this is a place where there are all kinds of people, and there are also all kinds of people coming to buy and um, to procure things, whether it's to procure shipping for their business, whether it's to um, find out what the latest news is from Rome, right? This is sort of the central clearing house. We saw this in Philippi as well and in Corinth. And this central clearing house What's really important about it is that we know Paul in particular, but we also know other preachers from the early Christian tradition were exactly here. Because this is the place where philosophy happened in the ancient world as well. This is where the Stoic philosophers would hang out. Why? Because you see these columns here? These columns would have had roofs on them. It would have been a covered space. And just like we don't want to be sitting outside listening to this lecture here in Raleigh, North Carolina, you definitely don't want to be out in this sun in May, you know, anywhere from like April until probably November. It's hot, it's desolate, and the, there's no air conditioning, right? So you find the covered spaces and you sit and chat for a while. And you can even see game boards um, etched into some of the pavements. So you play checkers or chess or whatever the game is that you want to play. But of course, that's also the opportunity to encounter community. It's also the opportunity to talk about this Jesus guy. It's also the opportunity to talk about the gathering of souls that happens um, in other spaces. Now, of course, there were slaves, and this is probably one of the places of slave trade in Ephesus. So this is you know, part of my challenge when, when they said to me, oh, you're never going to find slaves in the archaeology. Well, there they are. They're there, right? Now, it's true. They um, may not have left us so-and-so the slave was here, like they did in the theater, but they certainly leave the spaces of slave trading open. So I've got a, a citation from Philemon, which is where we have Onesimus, who is an enslaved person in the Christian tradition. Um, but what we're looking at here is this is actually not from Ephesus. It's from elsewhere. But you can see up top there's a, a faint shadow of a man who's sitting on a table. It's not a table, it's a clean A. It's a couch. You have smaller folks who are attending him. His horse is here. This is a grave marker. And one of the very typical things when you depict yourself on a grave marker in antiquity is you depict yourself lounging on a couch because that is how you would eat. So you're at a banquet, you're at a feast. That's the imagination of a good, um, a good repose once you've passed from this world. Um, but this stele then also shows us what this person did in life. So you have a bunch of people who are holding burdens and carrying them along in this um, panel. And then in the lower panel, and this is harder to see, you have a solitary figure walking and you have a coffle of people. And what do I mean by a coffle? You can see in this stele that there are chains around these people's necks and that they're connected to each other. This man, Timotheus, was a slave trader. And he is proud of this fact. He's proud enough of it, at least, to put this on his grave marker. He was one who led groups of people to be sold at slave markets. Um, and so I think one of the things we can imagine is that someone like Timotheus with his coffle of slaves would have been in this central area of Ephesus as well, which given that we know there were also folks talking about this Jesus guy, right? This is an opportunity for these folks who are enslaved um, to also hear about this Jesus guy and to hear about freedom in the gospel and the, to start to dream other dreams of what it might be to be free in the world. We do have some other evidence of enslaved people in antiquity. Um, these are handcuffs right here. Um, these are, uh, they look, they actually look like um, bike racks, but 
their racks from Herculaneum where um, they would have attached chains to enslaved folks. We don't have these things from Ephesus, but here's the thing. There's something really technical about materials in this part of the world. Metals often dissolve into the, into the earth, and so um, we don't have a lot of metal from Ephesus. We only have stone. Stone is not as pliable as metal. Um, it's also not as portable as metal. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of these kinds of artifacts. Top that off with, in the 60s and 70s, when the archaeologists first really started getting into these more um, everyday spaces of Ephesus, they took, brought in bulldozers and just went with all the stuff, right? Because what they really wanted to get to were the big monumental buildings. Um, these kinds of small finds didn't really matter to them. So some of, some of what we know about antiquity depends on what we thought was important when we first started studying it. Now this um, here is what's called a boule and a collar. So this um, strap would have wrapped around somebody's neck um, and this boule has a message on it that would have been attached to that collar. Um, and th this is from the fifth century, so it's a little bit later, but this idea that, um, sometimes we have this idea that Christians were kinder to slaves, Christians were better with slaves, Christians worked toward manumission. This slave collar tells us a different story because it is from a bishop in Rome whose slave Felix has run away. And he's put this collar on to say, I am the slave of the bishop Felix, I've run away, and if you find me, return me to Felix the bishop. Right? We have evidence of Christians being the same kind of slaveholders that other Romans were. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we need to then just sort of throw out this whole Christian idea of freedom in the gospel? Absolutely not. But what it does mean is that just like today, we have to reckon with our history, our more recent histories. Even in the first and second century, we have to reckon with those histories of injustices and the systems of injustice that folks are um, embedded within, and we have to do that even through our own archaeology. So we have this picture of enslaved folks who are um, bound and chained and tortured. Torture is definitely a part of enslaved life in the ancient world. But we also have other kinds of monumental buildings. Now these are the kinds of buildings that the archaeologists in the 60s and 70s loved to unearth, right? But here's what's interesting about this. This is the entrance into that um, marketplace. So you can see the space of the marketplace back behind here. And this is an enormous, enormous structure. It's probably, mm, the arch at the middle is probably 20 feet high or so, would you say? Yeah. Um, this is the gate of Mithridates, Mithridates and Metzeos. And Mithridates and Metzeos were enslaved men. They were slaves. But you know who they were slaves to? They were slaves to the emperor, to Emperor Augustus, right? So they were enslaved to the Emperor Augustus, and they put this up to honor their former master. Well, that tells us that there's also enslaved folks who have access, access to money, access to materials, access to power, who are also manipulating their world and their system in a different kind of way. And I think we also have to understand that there were probably enslaved folks in the early Christian communities who also had access, whether it was to spaces or to goods and services or to different kinds of um, abilities to travel within the world. Um, and these enslaved people were also incredibly helpful in paving the way for getting the gospel out to these various places within um, the ancient world. Now, I want to take us, we got like five minutes. I want to take us to the houses, because the houses are really cool. Did you go in the terrace houses? We got close. We got close. Okay. We're going to go in them today. So, there, remember the side of the hill. Here's the side of the hill. This is an ancient set of condominiums. These are like the luxury condominiums in downtown Raleigh, right? Or maybe the luxury condominiums on Central Park West. Um, these are like prime real estate. Um, and they're built up on a hill. So this is the road in the valley, and these, each of these is a terrace that goes up the hill. And there are six apartments in this whole um, complex. 
they're, they're built first in the first century BCE and they're destroyed by an earthquake in about 287 CE. So we have like clear evidence of them. Um, but we, what we also have is incredibly well-preserved walls and paintings and spaces themselves. So just to give you some orientation, I'm standing up on the third terrace and we're looking down on the second terrace. And there's one more set of condos like down below where this guy is standing. Um, and what we're looking at is, you see one, two, three, four, this four square, that's the central courtyard of the household. That's where you would walk in from the side street and here this would be open to the air there's a cistern underneath this, so you have drains at the corners of this particular space, and there's a cistern that you can access here. That's how you get your fresh drinking water. You collect the rainwater and let all the silt settle to the bottom of your cistern, and then you pull the fresh water up off the top. This is a time when you could trust that rainwater um, wasn't corrosive um, to stone or humans, <laughs> right? Uh, we might not want to do that today. But then all around this, you would have had a covered walkway where you would have shade from the sun, um, shelter from the rain, a little bit of warmth from the cold. And you can also see that there were mosaics on these floors. These are incredibly wealthy people's houses, right? These folks are the emperor's friends. These are the senators. These are the governors of the, of the um, provinces. These are the chief priests of the big cults in town, right? These are the folks who have got some cash. And they probably also have a huge plantation somewhere in the countryside, right? Which is where they go in the summertime to rest and relax and refresh and, um, you know, tend to their grapes and whatever it is, whatever it is they do. But one of the things that we have to reckon with is that while these were owned by wealthy folks, these spaces, which include incredible decorations, these are frescoes, which is paint that's put onto wet plaster and then allowed to dry so that it absorbs into the wall itself. Um, while we have these incredible decorations, these houses also needed to be tended while the owners were away. And who was doing that? Their slaves. What were their slaves doing while their owners were away? Well, you know, in the literature, the masters say, well, they're supposed to, you know, just keep everything nice and neat and only invite people who the master would invite and to be, you know, be proxies for their masters. But come on. Let's say you got a group of friends who want to gather together for a church service or a Eucharist. What's it going to hurt if we come hang out in here as a group of Christ followers? Our master is not a Christ follower. We have friends who are free and not. This is a space that's available, and it's a movable feast of sorts, right? So we can think about non-elite folks being in these spaces even as these spaces are built by the most elite in the ancient world. What we're looking at here, this, is, this room is, it's called the theater room, and it's um, a collection of what we think are actors and actresses from the day um, who would have been well known in the theater, um, who were just sort of painted and their names are written right above their heads. Um, this is from a different room, um, but that's a, a bust of Socrates, the philosopher. So we have um, some evidence that philosophy was part of the conversation that was happening in these houses. Um, and the pockmarks are... Um, when you go to renovate, so this is a different layer of renovation. They decided to change the interior design. You, you pockmark the old um, plaster so that the new plaster will stick better. And so that's, that's what happened. Those are ancient, um, ancient marks, not new marks. The mosaics in this place are incredible. I just wanted you to see this just because it's so beautiful. <laughs> This is um, Medusa. You can see the snakes in her hair and the wings on her forehead. Um, and she's just exquisite. Each of these little pieces are little pebbles of river stone um, that were cut in the right, right way and put into this mosaic. Now, it is true that only the wealthiest could afford such artistry in their homes, right? You're, 
I mean, this isn't something I'd have in my home to walk on, but they walked on it, right? It was their floor, and it was beautiful, and it was gorgeous. Um, we so often think only about the owners of this instead of about the craftspeople who would have made it, about the people who knew how to cut the stones, about the people who knew how to design the mosaic, about the people who knew how to mix the grout just the right way so that it would stay that way, and then about the people who got on their hands and knees and scrubbed it whenever it needed scrubbing, right? These are all people who are encountering these objects just as much as we are admiring them. Um, so let me show you a little bit of the technology in these houses because I think it's really fascinating. Um, so what we're looking at in this bottom picture are what we call hypocausts. And they're just little pillars of bricks that are, that are built up and they're if you look at, well, in antiquity, the tops of them were all at a level, a level space. And you would put a floor then on top of it. Um, and you can see right here, there's these um, air vents that come from a furnace that's behind the wall. So what you'd do is you'd stoke a fire in that furnace and you would push the warmed air in through all of these hollow spaces and you'd have a radiant heat floor, right? I mean, we talk about that as being the newest technology um, in, in our own ecological LEED certified world, and the Romans were already doing it. Now, they were not LEED certified because they cut down huge forests in order to stoke those furnaces in order to have these radiant heat floors. But this would have been part of a private spa area in these particular houses. Um, what was also unusual about these houses is they had kitchens. So one of the things that was true, I mean, speaking of Martha and kitchens, <laughs> one of the things that was true of antiquity was that you didn't have, everybody didn't have a kitchen in their own house. Why? Because you'd burn the place down with that many kitchens. So there were often communal kitchens in cities, but the wealthy had kitchens in their houses and they had slaves to tend to these kitchens. And so here we have, um, this is both a stove and an oven. So you have a channel here where you can place your wood and stoke your fire and get it going nice and hot. And then you can fry up, you know, whatever it is you want on the top of this surface once it gets warm. But of course it takes several hours of high burning, high density wood in order to get hot. Um, and then, you know, if you wanted to bake your bread, you also can put it in under the, under the coals. Um, these kinds of ovens are actually, um, that technology doesn't get replaced until electricity and gas comes into the world. These are the kinds of ovens that um, many folks uh, used when they settled here in North Carolina. Um, you think about, so if you've ever been over to Old Salem in, in Winston um, to the bakery, go talk to the guy who runs the oven. It's fascinating and it's a lot like this one. The other thing they had in this house, latrines. That was the other piece. The other thing that's, um, that is fascinating to me about antiquity is that you don't have a place to use the bathroom in your house. You go to the public toilet, except in these houses where we have, um, back here you have the trench that would have um, clean water for washing yourself and then you have the trench where the waste would go and you have a system of pipes, and you can see them here. You have a system of pipes running throughout this house that takes it down to the sewer that runs underneath the major street that goes out into the harbor. Do not swim in the harbor at Ephesus. But <laughs> the, the fact of sanitation and sewer systems in the ancient world tells you something about how concerned they were with public health, how, um, how important it was for them to get waste out of the city and to have fresh water and clean, um, clean hygiene. So we have also then folks who work with those kinds of things. We have folks who are sanitation workers, folks who scrub the public latrine and the private latrines. These are all folks who, for whom this is evidence as well. I think I'm gonna just stop there because what I want us, the point of this is to show you how cool some of the ancient technology is, but also to show you how we can start to imagine a variety of people in these spaces. That it's not just when we look at these spaces, and you can do this with any kind of historical building you go to, whether it's the Biltmore or, um, 
you know, a, a college campus, right? You can start to see that every space we're in has a community already built into it precisely because it's been built. So even this space around us, we can think about the designers and the workers and the electricians and the plumbers and the metal workers, the welders, the concrete pourers, the carpet weavers, right, who are all part of this community. And I think that's part of what it means to be the community in Christ, is to recognize that nowhere do we go where we are alone and where we are not um, participating in the larger community around us in some way or another. Um, and I think that's a powerful message to take back to our biblical texts and to start to see the ways in which there's people everywhere in our community. Um, there are a myriad of faces and voices in our ancient texts that we have yet to discover. All we need is our imagination. Well, that was really cool. And um, yeah, this is exactly one of the places that we went um, when 30 of us from CTK went in the footsteps of Paul. Uh, we saw Philippi, where the jail is, where uh, Paul was enslaved, or sorry, when Paul was imprisoned. Um, we saw Corinth, you know, where he went. We saw Berea, where um, he stood there. And here in Ephesus, you see those remnants of early Christianity and the juxtaposition of there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, with a world that continues to struggle with that. And um, I'm not gonna say a lot about sabbatical. First of all, the cement is still just drying on this sabbatical. And uh, I have a lot that I want to process and um, bring to you, which I plan to do in September when we start getting back to doing uh, a Bible study on Sunday mornings. Probably that first one, we haven't planned all this out yet. Probably that first one will be things I learned um, on sabbatical. But uh, one of the things that's just front of mind is how there's nothing new under the sun, that the problems they were dealing with are still some of the very same problems that we deal with. And just as Dr. Shaner said in, in her sermon today, right, it, it, it's our time to speak up. These cycles continue to perpetuate until we say, hey, enough's enough, right? Um, one of the sites in Ephesus that is just captivating is that there's a public toilet, right? And in this public toilet, which is men only, there were toilets where people, uh, there were VIP spots. You had your spot. If you were an important man in Ephesus, you had your spot in the toilet. And, you know, every morning at 8 a.m. or something, all of the important men would go sit on their toilets closer than these chairs are to each other, and they would sit and read the newspaper. We don't really know. But one of the things that they told us on the tour is that their slaves got up earlier than they did and didn't use the toilet, but sat on the cold stone with their bare bottoms to warm up the toilets for their masters, right? So in this one little story, what do we have? Um, we have a ridiculous hierarchy, right? We have a ridiculous men jockeying for literally who are they going to sit next to while they evacuate their bowels, right? We have slaves forced into humiliating labor, right? So you have, you have this whole picture and you go down the streets of Ephesus and you're like, wow, there is nothing new under the sun. And also, the power of the gospel is as potent today as it was in that ancient world, right? The things that Paul said that were so revolutionary are as important today as they were then. Um, pastor Athena has to leave, and, and you know the other pastors aren't here, uh, but um, one of the things that I felt on sabbatical 
was how much of, I don't know if relief is the, I'm, I'm still processing here, so I apologize if I don't get these words uh, done that well, but um, I was grateful that somebody else was preaching after Uvalde. I was grateful that somebody else was preaching after Roe v. Wade. And I realized how much stress that is on a preacher who's already written a sermon, right? <laughs> to like go back in and have to preach something prophetic. Um, but when it's done, and it's done as well as the people who did it uh, here and in, in other places that I saw, it's a powerful word. And um, the thing that we do here at church still really means an awful lot in the world. Last thing I'm going to say, um, I visited a bunch of churches. I went to church in several states and several countries. I've been to chapels in, you know, uh, basilicas. I've been to cathedrals and Lutheran churches. I've been to mega churches and contemporary churches and traditional churches. Um, I only got uh, kicked out of one, and that's because I wasn't Catholic. But, uh, and I only walked out of one, and that's because their theology needed to be walked out on. But uh, you see the Christian expression play out in a bunch of different places, and there wasn't a single church that I would be as excited to be at as this one. There, this is a rare, it's a rare uh, opportunity to not check our brains at the door, to take what we learn here and go out into the world and do God's work there. And I think we're just only getting started. So uh, there'll be a lot more from me, but i um, just really grateful to be back and I'm grateful to have Dr. Shaner bring this word about Ephesus. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's say a prayer. Hey God, we give you thanks for this time together to learn, to learn from Paul, to learn from those who are voiceless um, in these ancient cities, to learn from Dr. Shaner. We give you thanks for the gospel message that brings us good news when we need it, and more importantly, maybe, when others need us to bring it on God's behalf. Help us, Lord, stir us up. Help us to be leaders of change in our world. Help us to reimagine what Paul meant when he said, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Help us to make the world a place where all people are truly welcome, no exceptions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get ready for church. And um, if you're going to stick around, we've got a lot of food coming later. So start, start thinking about how much food you can eat.